Chairman, thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> to the two uh, panelists, thank you for being here for your service to our nation. Uh, I'm always uh, interested. I've been on this committee for 20 years, so I go back to the uh, Iraq War and 9-11 and all the tragedies of 9-11. And I heard you, Madam Secretary, uh, and also General Austin, uh, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, Madam Secretary, sequestration. General Alston keeps talking about resources. Uh, we've had the service chiefs in here recently uh, to talk about their budgets. And I know the world is very unsettled. I know that we have a certain responsibility, first to the American people and then to our friends in other regions of the world. I don't dispute that at all. But I just wonder when you you know, you're talking about the training the security forces in Afghanistan that uh, it's, uh, you know, still is going well or it's going okay, and maybe it's a better word than well. Uh, it's a long process. I just wondered, I'm not a great student of history, but I did study history. I just wonder how much longer can we as a nation, and you are a national figure because you're in the administration general you're an outstanding military man yourself how much longer can we keep going down this road and expect our military to continue to do this and that when their budgets are being cut behind them and uh i i have been a strong proponent if we're going to get serious about the world situation we need to have a war tax we cannot keep playing this budget game that we keep playing here in Washington and have you come testify. And then we have to battle this thing on the floor of the House, the chairman and ranking member do, of trying to salvage whatever money we can salvage. So my point is, are we getting to a point that, as, as you th I think General Austin said, is, is, aren't we at a point that we need to say the administration, military leaders, you know, you in Saudi, you got a lot of troops. Put your troops on the ground. Uh, we got a hundred to two hundred thousand uh, Iraqis in the military. Uh, I know what we're trying to do. ISA, uh, some approximations I've heard is twenty to thirty thousand fighters. And General Austin, you said we've already killed eight thousand. So let's take the high figure of thirty thousand ISA. Uh, jihadists and, and re reduce that to 20. I don't understand the numbers of this thing, the financial numbers, nor do I understand the numbers of kill. And how in the world are we going to continue to expand and send our troops around the world and try to take care of everybody else's problems if they won't step up and take care of it themselves and say to America, you, you back us up, but we're going to be the front-line troops. I don't know. I'm not criticizing the administration. I just don't know how much longer this game can keep going on. Congressman, if I could try to respond to a couple of those points. Uh, I think fundamentally we've tried in a number of different areas, particularly I would say Afghanistan, but also in terms of the counter-ISIL campaign, to work very much uh, by, with, and through partner countries. So in Afghanistan, you know, we are very much trying to enable the ANSF to be able to take care of their own security. You know, fundamentally, we got in there, as you well know, after 9-11 to ensure that Afghanistan would not be a safe haven for, for al-Qaeda. But in the next two years, I think we feel um, pretty good about what we're going to be able to do with the ANSF so that they will be able to take over by the end of 2016. Uh, and take care of their security themselves. We'll stay there in a, in a relatively small security cooperation footprint in Kabul, uh, but it will largely be their responsibility at that point. And in, uh, in Iraq and Syria, you know, we are, we are working very closely with a, a huge coalition, and about uh, more than a dozen of those members are contributing to the military coalition. So, so I think we are very much trying to take an approach that isn't about America doing everything for everyone, but trying to work with others to help them do more for themselves. And I'm sure General Austin will want to add to that. And in terms of the effects that we're having on, uh, on the enemy, sir, and in terms of the numbers, I think that uh, the numbers are input to the overall calculus in terms of the effects created. But I think it's more important to focus on the effects and as we look at ISIL's uh, behavior today, you know, you go back uh, several months ago, 
ISIL was uh, moving around in large uh, convoy formations, flying a lot of black flags, taking up large swaths of territory. They can no longer do that. Uh, and it's principally because of the effects that we've had on — they have the ability to cr recruit uh, more, more f uh, fighters into the country, and, and we know that. And so it's not about just uh, the kinetic effects alone. It's about that, plus uh, reducing his ability to recruit foreign fighters, plus reducing his ability to finance himself. That creates the effects that we're beginning to see. And the, the enemy is beginning to struggle uh, in a number of areas, in terms of governing, in terms of uh, ability to control territory. Sir. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Mr. Courtney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses. Um, Again, just to go back for a moment regarding some of your testimony concerning um, our um, relationship with the Israeli uh, government and military. Uh, again, General Dempsey has been before this committee a number of times and talked about how the mill-to-mill -mill, uh, connection.